that that sounds good well it's nice to meet you all um uh virtually and it's nice to be invited i love um i love talking about this stuff i particularly like talking about it to people who who have some degree in in many cases a big degree of familiarity with what i'm talking about um needless to say um some maybe even lots of what i'm going to say will be familiar to some of you all of you potentially um but i don't want to take any of that existing knowledge for granted so um bear with me if if, if some of what i'm saying is is uh, second nature to you and yeah what i what um heather and i talked about in advance was that i would kind of just basically try and give an overview of what the book's about um kind of its main themes its main arguments um Anyone that's read the book will know there's quite a lot of sort of technical stuff. It gets into kind of wonky stuff quite a lot. I'm going to try and abstract from that in what I talk about now and keep it at a relatively general level. But I'm more than happy to kind of get into the into the into the wonky stuff in quest in questions, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion afterwards. Um, so. I think the best place to start is to say <clears throat> is to is to say that the book is specifically about electricity. I think that's the, the best place to start to kind of set the terms of, of what it is and isn't about. Um, so it's a very kind of broad title to the book, but it actually the topic is quite specific. It's about electricity. I didn't choose the title. I definitely didn't choose the subtitle. That's the publisher that chooses that 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 chooses that. Um so it's about electricity, which begs the question about about why it's about electricity. And again, this this uh, this will be obvious, I think, to many of you. But but obviously, if we focus on um, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, something like seventy five percent is carbon dioxide, and about something like seventy five percent of that carbon dioxide, anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions, is from the combustion of fossil fuels. And then, if you focus in on the combustion of fossil fuels electricity generation is the the biggest component of that um so that's the first thing to say about why electricity and then and then the second component to say about why electricity is obviously that to a significant degree the strategy that is being adopted around the world to decarbonize other parts of the economy things like transportation things like industrial processes uh, buildings, heating, and so on, is through electrification, i.e. the theory being that you electrify as much as you can, and then you generate um, that, that electricity through non-carbon uh, generating sources. And so um, the bottom line is that if electricity is important today, it's going to be even more important in the future in terms of the overall energy mix which makes it doubly important that electricity is decarbonized as swiftly as possible. So that's why the book focuses on electricity. Electricity isn't everything in terms of decarbonization, but it's a it's a it's a big element of it, and 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 I think inarguably the most important element. So with that said, um, I think the next qu question is to think about is how how are we doing globally? on decarbonizing electricity generation are we are we winning um that race as some people um say my my view on that is that um the answer one gives to that question is very much dependent on whether you're kind of a glass half full or a glass half empty person if you're a glass half full person you kind of look at those charts that show rapidly increasing um, capacity investment, rapidly increasing um, um, uh, terrible hours being generated from renewables uh, globally. And you think, yeah, we are, we're doing very, very, very well. If you're a glass half empty person, you kind of, you forget the renewables numbers and you say, well, be that as it may, it's still the case that every single year globally, we are continuing to generate more electricity through burning fossil fuels. And if, and if you, and if you, and if you focus on that particular metric, then I think it's fair to say that it's impossible to argue that we are in any case, in any sense, winning while that number is still in increasing. And in fact, even when it starts to decline, which I mean, people have been saying it's going to start declining every year for about the last five years and it still doesn't. Um, 
presumably it will soon. But even when it does start declining, if that decline is very slow, then we are essentially continuing to still losing. It needs to come down uh, quickly, not slowly. So that's my view on kind of where where we are at globally on electricity generation, on electricity decarbonisation, sorry. And then the last thing I want to say about that, and I'll come back to this if I have time right at the end, is to note a very obvious point, which is that there is massive regional variance globally in the pace and scale of decarbonisation of electricity generation. So it's very, very difficult to generalise about this uh, globally. Um, So on the one hand, you have countries like Sweden, where I am, where essentially electricity generation has been decarbonised for decades. Um, I don't think there's been a year in the last 20 years when uh, the burning of fossil fuels has accounted for more than three or four percent of electricity generation. And today in Sweden, you have broadly equal mixes of nuclear, hydro and wind. And I think it's about one to two percent is the combustion of fossil fuels. But then at the other end of the, of, of the spectrum, you have countries where still in excess of 90 percent of electricity generation is through the burning of fossil fuels. South Africa would be a, one a good and significant example of that, but it's not the only one. I think Australia, the last time I looked, is somewhere between 60 and 65 um, percent uh, burning of fossil fuels. So Australia is, is is a laggard, absolutely. In that, I don't think it's you could argue with that is a laggard in that sense. Not least given it's the fact that it's a it's a relatively wealthy nation. It should be doing much better. Um, and obviously, there's there's all sorts of reasons why it isn't. Um, um, but huge regional variance uh, globally, and I'll come back to that point. Uh, at the end, if I have time. So that's where that's kind of what, what it's about and why it's about it. The, the second thing I want to talk about before getting into some arguments about why we, in my view, we are uh, going too slowly on this, is to talk a little bit about about um, what the dominant policy approach to electricity decarbonisation is around the world, because not least because that. Um, plays a significant role in determining what I've written about in the book and what I'm going to be talking about today. And there are, and and again, there are three, there are three things I want to say about that. So the first of those is to say that for the most part around the world, and this is a gross generalization, but I think it's a fair generalization, for the most part around the world, the way in which um, um, uh, the combination of industry and government is approaching electricity decarbonisation is principally through solar and wind. So, so of course, there are countries where hydro is and will continue to be an important part of the mix. There are definitely countries where that uh, that applies to nuclear and where you are likely to see new, uh, new nuclear uh, power plants coming on stream. But I don't think anyone uh, in terms of energy forecasters is expecting to see a significant increase in the role of nuclear or hydro in the supply mix going forward. Nuclear globally right now is at about 9%. Maybe it will go back up to sort of 12, 13%, but I don't think anyone's really expecting it to go above 15%, which was where it was at its peak. Um, and and the same is 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 true of hydro. So most in most countries, the expectation is that solar and wind in varying mixes will do the large part of the, of the job in terms of electricity decarbonisation. And then, of course, um, um, there are issues around, you know, baseload supply, whether that's going to be nuclear or um, or unabated gas, potentially, oh, sorry, abated gas in some countries, the role of storage, the role of imports in certain European countries, for example, all of those things factor in. But for the most part, solar and wind are being expected to do the bulk of the job. And that's why, uh, to be clear, the book focuses on solar and wind. It it doesn't talk to a significant extent about nuclear, not necessarily because I personally think that we should be focusing on solar and wind rather than nuclear, but because that is predominantly what the world is doing. Second thing to say about the dominant policy approach globally um, is that for the most part, um, the expectation 
is that the private sector will lead the way. Um, so, and again, there are obviously important exceptions to this. China, to a significant extent, probably being the most important exception insofar as so much of this is being done by state-owned enterprises and Beijing is obviously, and provincial authorities are playing a very important role. But for the most part around the world, what governments are not doing is saying, we are going to do this ourselves. We are going to finance it. It's going to be public investment. And these are going to be publicly owned and operated assets, which is not to say that the public sector doesn't play any role. Governments design and regulate electricity markets. It, just as importantly, governments provide all, a, a huge range of types of support mechanisms and subsidy mechanisms to help essentially nudge the private sector in the right direction, where it's believed to be the case that the private sector needs that incentivization. Um, but, the, but as I said, the public sector is principally not doing it itself. For the most part, governments are saying, we expect you, the private sector, to do this. We'll help nudge you in the right direction if, if you need that nudging. So that's the second thing. And then the, thir the third thing to say is that, um, you know, is that while there is definitely an expectation that distributed energy generation, um, uh, rooftop solar, for example, which represented a massive part of investment in China yeah. last year and this year, will play a significant role. Utility scale investment is being is expected by private sector actors is expected to do the bulk of the work in terms of um, ramping up carbon free electricity generation and hence enabling the decarbonization of the electricity sector. So again, the book is focused principally on utility scale, um, solar and wind, um, um, while recognizing that distributed generation can and will play an important role, although it, it, one can have lots of different debate about the nature of that role and how it fits with uh, more centralized en energy generation. I'm happy to um, discuss that if, if people want. Okay, so that's the that's the kind of setup. So why why is this going too slowly? And as I say, in my view, um, it's it's unarguable that it is going much too slowly globally. Um, the I guess the place I start in the book, as anyone who who's read it will know, is what is with what in my mind <clears throat> is the most common answer to that question that we find out there in the in the world. And interestingly, I, I in my view this answer kind of runs across the the political and ideological spectrum. So whether it's people on the left or the right, they tend to, to point to the same mix of factors. They'll point uh, in different degrees to different uh, factors. But for the most part, their arguments are, are um, similar in the sense that what in, in the sense that what the, the answer they give is that we are going too slowly because of a, mo a mix of kind of political slash policy um, slash bureaucratic reasons. So what you will hear people saying is that is, for example, there's too much red tape. It get it takes too long, way too long to get grid connections. It takes too long and it's too cumbersome a process to get uh, planning permission to proceed with new wind and solar projects. Uh, the power of the NIMBY lobby is 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 too significant in kind of um, preventing developments from going ahead. Uh, the fossil fuel uh, lobby has too much influence in terms of uh, stymieing uh, renewables developments and so on and so forth. And and it, and a very important component of that kind of hegemonic answer is that what the reason is not is is of an economic nature. And 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 that argument further says. The, the reason that, that the, the obstacles are no longer of an economic nature is because the economics have essentially been sold. And that and that argument, and everyone will have heard this argument, basically run the, runs along the lines of the economics used to be an obstacle because um, the, the, um, the relative generating costs, the, le the levelized cost of energy or a levelized cost of electricity, for, in terms of solar and wind, used to be higher, and in the case of solar, significantly higher than it was for natural gas or coal, or even in some cases, the nuclear. But over the last 15 years or so, we've seen those generating costs come down so far and so rapidly that already by the mid 2010s, in many parts of the world, you had reached a position of grid parity, where 
it was as cheap, if not cheaper, to generate electricity uh, uh, renewably than through burning fossil fuels. And at that point, we had basically solved the economics. The economics had been resolved. And therefore, because we had solved the economics, it can only be the case that the, the significant remaining obstacles to faster decarbonisation are of a non-economic nature. They exist in the political and planning realm. And the basic argument of my book is that that argument is wrong, um, which is not to say that those other obstacles are not factors. Of course, they are significant factors to different degrees in different parts of the world. All of those things that I mentioned are significant obstacles. But my argument is that the, the economics is still a significant obstacle, uh, despite those cost reductions. And, and the, the basic argument I'm, I make there, and I'm not going to get into um, the details of it here because I don't have the time, but I'm very happy to kind of expand upon it and kind of get into the granularity if people want to. But the basic argument there is that the obstacle, the economic obstacles that remain pertain specifically to the question of profitability. Um, um, which is to say, which is another way of saying that, in my view, looking at the question of the economics here, specifically through the lens of the levelized cost, is actually a bit of a red herring. And it's far more beneficial and instructive to think specifically about the profitability of the renewables business. And, I, and just to be clear, I'm talking here about the business of deployment. So I'm talking about the business of developing wind and solar farms owning and operating them and, and obviously specifically selling the electricity that they generate. And the, and the argument there is that, is that in terms of profitability, um, that is, is not necessarily um, a business which is sufficiently attractive um, to attract the type of the, 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 the level of investment uh, that is, that is currently required. And obviously in so far as we are relying globally on the private sector to do this, and insofar as the private sector is is um, lives or dies and, and is guided by profitability considerations, not to the exclusion of everything else, obviously, but profit profitability considerations necessarily come first and foremost. Insofar as that's a, that's true, then that is clearly a problem. What I what I uh, because profitability drives capitalist enterprises. What I will do is just is 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 expand on that argument a wee bit here, um, and and to do so by saying that there are basically two kind of parts to that argument, um, which are they're connected to one another, but they are they are I think usefully thought about separately. So the first of those is is not about the is about the volatility of of profitability, and the, the basic argument here is that. The, it, it, the, the business of, renew, of renewables deployment, the business of, of, of renewable electricity generation is, is typically in most parts of the world and in particularly in, um, in deregulated or liberalized electricity systems such as I believe Australia has. I don't talk much about Australia in the book, but I, um, but I do talk uh, a lot about other, other liberalized markets, particularly in those parts of the world, although not only in those parts of the world, um, electricity pricing and therefore electricity revenues and profitability tend to be very, very volatile. And, and, that, and that that price volatility presents a particularly significant challenge to the business of raising finance for, uh, for the renewables business in, in a way that is much less true when it comes to fossil fuel fired conventional power plants. And I'm happy to talk about why there's that difference. And, and what that tends to mean is that um, is, is that raising finance for solar and wind projects, which typically means raising debt. So, so, so as many of you, I'm sure, will know, most renewables projects, whoever the developer is, tend to be predominantly financed through uh, debt rather than through equity. Um, that volatility makes it very, very different, difficult, excuse me, to raise that debt finance. And and let and 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 as I'm sure many of you know that's typically referred to as a problem of bankability, and and that that challenge is very very significant, except where mechanisms are available to stabilize 
uh, the electricity price that that generator will receive over the long term. And of course, those stabilization mechanisms can come in a variety of different forms. They can be um, they can be mechanisms that are provided by government. Um, so uh, in large parts of the world, that has been feed in tariffs and or um, uh, feed in premiums like contracts for difference, or it can be, and as increasingly is the case in the US, it could be corporate power purchase agreements with an Amazon or a Google. And in both of those cases, um, if the developer is able to get a, a uh, to get a contract that will entail a fixed power price for the next 12 or 15 years, that makes it much, much easier to raise that finance because the volatility that scares off um, uh, financial institutions has been mitigated. So that's the first um aspect is the volatility of profitability, which presents a significant bankability challenge. And then separate but connected to that, there is a challenge related to the level of profitability. And the basic argument here is, is that that business, that renewable renewables business in general and on average, and of course this varies significantly across space and time according to many different factors, not the least of which is the nature and level of government support. But that business tends to be a relatively low returns business um, um, in, in relative terms. It's, of course, it's always uh, uh, mean, meaningless to talk about profitability, the level of profitability in absolute terms. It only really means anything in relative terms. You know, five to eight percent, which is the typical uh, internal rate of return that renewables developers are looking at for those projects may look good in a particular macroeconomic context and it may look good if you are uh, a business that whose other investment opportunities promise lower returns but it might look very very uh, poor if you have higher uh, levels of returns available through other investment options which of course if you are a, a big oil and gas producer in recent years you absolutely have higher returns uh, business businesses available to you for investment and so here the basic are, and, I, and I'm happy to get in, into discussion about why it is that profitability tends to be pretty low in this business. I'm not going to get into that now. Um, but the fact that it is relatively low clearly presents investment challenges, given that we are relying on the, the private sector to do this. Um, typically, the private sector doesn't prioritize. Sorry, if I'm moving, I'm moving around because my I have this energy saving thing in my office where my lights go out if I don't move. Uh, every few minutes. So if you see me doing that, that's I'm not mad or not that mad, but that's why I'm doing that. Um, so the relatively low profitability presents its own investment challenge, as well as the uh, the the, vol the volatility and the bankability challenge that that presents. Um, um, that's as much as I want to say about the the core um, argument of the book. Um, let me say two more things before I wrap up and so that we have lots of time to, to for discussion and, and questions and so on. That the, the first of those is 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 the question of, of of insofar as that argument is true and insofar as as the the argument is recognized as being true. And I think that there are many people and constituencies out there who realize these things, despite the fact that there's this kind of dominant narrative out there in the public realm that that says the economics have been solved because renewables are cheap. Um, and and I say that because I you know since the book has been published, I've had lots and lots of emails from people in the industry, for example, saying, "Yeah, this is completely right, and it's nice to hear someone outside the industry." recognizing that and i've had emails to that effect from all around all around the world interestingly and and so there are there are clearly there are people that recognize these things are are problems um so that raises the question of of what those constituencies see as the potential answer to these uh, to these challenges and i again i don't want to get into the details here but i think a range of different arguments are on the table about what can and should be done to resolve this challenge and to therefore precipitate faster investment so very very briefly one of those one of the one of the sets of answers typically revolve around ideas about market market design so the argument there would be um the issue is that 
is that the problem is with the design of electricity markets, in particular wholesale markets as we have them. And if we redesign those markets, then those profitability challenges around volatility and the level of returns will, will thereby re be resolved. So that's one argument. Another one is that another argument would be to say, yes, the profitability, these, pro these profitability issues are obstacles. And so therefore the answer is simply to beef up and retain the, the government provided sub subsidy and support mechanisms that we have around the world. And, and to my mind, that's what the Inflation Reduction Act absolutely was in the US. It was a recognition that um, the attenuation of subsidies, the reduction in level of tax credits in the US was, uh, was exacerbating the profitability challenges and therefore the tax credits needed to be bolstered and 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 extended in order to essentially, of course, it wasn't put in these terms, to re-inflate profitability in the sector and therefore attract more investment. Um, that's another answer. Um, another answer still, typically the one you hear from 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 uh, constituencies on the left would say, look, if 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 this is if this is the case, and if if the private sector is not sufficiently incentivized by existing uh, expected levels of return to carry out this investment, then we should be doing it through the public sector instead. So, uh, and 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 that argument has been aired quite widely, I think in recent years, it was at the very heart of all the various Green New Deal um, uh, proposals that were originally developed in the mid to late 2010s on both sides of the Atlantic at, at any rate. Um, and so that's a kind of a third answer that, that that's out there. But and I think those are probably the main three. Although I think there are other ones as well on the particularly on the demand side. Those are all supply side focused things. So that's the 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 penultimate thing I wanted to talk about. And then last of all, uh, just before I wrap up, um, um, I want to return quickly to that issue of um, the geography of all this around the world and the. Um, the the um uh the regionality and the fact that and the fact that we don't have one global energy transition but we have a series of regional transitions of different of different types different speeds different scale in different parts of the world um simply to say that um to my mind it's 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 uh, it, it's interesting that you know, I'm based in Europe. I, I'm, I'm often having conversations with people that are based in Europe or in other parts of the global north, particularly in North America or Europe. And there's a very strong tendency to think and focus of, on places within the global north, particularly Europe and North America and these debates. But, cle but clearly the reality um, when it comes to, to the, these questions at the global level is that is that while while what happens in Europe and North America are clearly significant, they matter. They matter not least because, in the U.S. case, for example, per capita electricity consumption is so damn high. Um, nevertheless, the 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 really important stuff, the the decisions that are made or not made, that will make the biggest differences globally to the pace and scale of electricity decarbonization around the world are not the things that happen in Europe and North America. They are increasingly going to be the things that happen across the global South. And that, and that is true, I think, for two reasons. So the, the first, which, which may be obvious, but I think they're worth emphasizing nonetheless. The first of those is that on average and in general, the electricity sectors of countries in the global South tend to tend to be more fossil fuel intensive still than a, than across the global north um so I, I mentioned already south africa but you can think about places like nigeria you can think about um india 75 percent coal generation china still around 65 percent coal generation and if you look at indonesia pakistan and others much higher levels of, of fossil fuel generation still so on average they are they are much more fossil fuel intensive and then just as importantly it's precisely in those parts of the world where by almost any reckoning we can expect the greatest increases in energy production and consumption uh, electricity consumption going forward and so for both of those reasons 
it, it is the pace and scale of decarbonisation of electricity sectors in those parts of the world that will make that that give you the biggest bang for the buck that will make the biggest difference going forward to the degree to which we succeed or fail globally on electricity decarbonisation. So it's absolutely what happens in China and India and Nigeria and South Africa that will make the biggest difference, not what happens in the UK or the US, still less Sweden, um, that will that will make the biggest difference uh, going forward. And I think that's a really important point to make. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say on that is that the is that the problem, of course, is that precisely the economic challenges that I've been talking about tend to be greatest precisely in those parts of the world where the the, the investment is really, really needed. Um, if you look, for example, at questions of financing, the cost of financing renewable energy projects in Senegal or in South Africa or in India is, is, is typically many times higher uh, than it is in the UK or Sweden, not sure about Australia. Um, and 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 that is that is a big problem. Um, so precisely where we we need the investment most is precisely where the economic and specifically financial challenges to um to raising that investment are most significant. And I'll leave it there. I've talked for almost exactly half an hour, which was which was more or less what I hoped and expected to do. So thank you for listening. Perfect uh, timing. You're a pro, I can see. Um, so I'll encourage everyone to um, put some questions in the chat uh, or and use that as a way of letting me know that you've got questions. But I, I'm going to start by just getting some more background, um, Brett, on what on earth possessed you to write this book. You're not an economist and you're not an engineer. I think lots of us here are engineers, Paris, sorry. Um, and, uh, and you know, you g gathered some really wonderful material and got access to some some really important uh, people. So, so tell <clears throat> us a bit more about that journey. Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. So I, I'm not an economist and I'm not an engineer. Um, and that definitely um, presented some some challenges in in doing the book. Um, uh, but I also think it has some advantages. Um, I mean, one of the challenges is that, you know, I've done a lot of research on finance in the past and finance is complicated, but I, quite, I hadn't quite realized that that electricity is even more complicated than 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 finance, actually, not least because you have to have at least some awareness of the engineering issues in addition to all the economic issues you can't you can't um disentangle the two completely from one another um so that that definitely raised challenges um the the how i came to it so i um as i said i do a lot of i've been doing a lot of research for more than more than a decade now on, now on finance and what you might call kind of finance capitalism um and i had been doing quite a lot of research on the on on finance in relation to climate, but on the dirty side of the equation. So I did quite a lot of research looking at the question of ongoing investment in fossil fuel companies, you know, why, to what extent and why asset managers and pension funds and so on are or are not disinvesting from the shells and the BPs and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so it seemed a natural progression from folk from doing research on finance in relation to the dirty side of the of the energy equation to thinking about the clean side but so that was uh, that was one thing i'd also been doing uh, the the book i wrote previously to this was a was specifically about asset managers um uh, the blackstones and the macquarie's you know the book actually was in large part about macquarie the the australian based asset manager uh and and what I realized was that a lot of the big infrastructure asset managers like Macquarie, like Brookfield, like BlackRock and so on, that renewable energy had become a, a, a very significant component of their infrastructure investment businesses over the last 15 years or so. So that peaked, that definitely piqued my interest in doing that research on asset managers was to think specifically about renewable energy. And then also... Um, I, I, I'd read, a, I, I, several years ago, I read, um, I read um, Andreas Malm's 
first major book in English called Fossil Capital, which some of you may be aware of. And it, it's, it's a great book. And, and to cut a long story short, his book is about the transition to fossil fuels rather than today away from fossil fuels, but specifically uh, in the early part of the Industrial Revolution and the question of why um, why they why within within kind of the early cotton industry in 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 England there was a shift from water and the water wheel to steam and coal, and he made this what I thought was a very elegant argument, saying that ultimately it wasn't about price; it was about profitability. I mean that was the, that was the argument he made, um, and it made me stand up and think, well, oh, hang on a sec, everyone's arguing that today things are going swimmingly because of this price argument. Um, maybe we should be actually be thinking about profitability. And so it seemed to me there was an interesting sort of, um, there was an in interesting kind of impetus to think about the contemporary transition that is or isn't occurring in those particular terms. In terms of, in terms of the material I was, I was able to get here, um, you know, most of the research was desk-based, but I did do quite a lot of interviews. I did do quite a lot of interviews as well. And just to be clear about who I mainly spoke to, I mainly spoke to um, financial institutions and and that are involved in energy finance, um, particularly clean energy finance, and pr principally on the debt side. So, as I said earlier, um, when renewable energy developers of whatever scale or type are are um, thinking about developing a new solar or wind farm. Um, in almost all cases, they they aim to raise significant amounts of debt to do that, and and there are a range of different investment banks um, around the world who are specialists in providing that in providing that debt. And so, I a lot of the discussions I have were with people working at those banks who are um, engaged in financing or not financing, as the case <laughs> may be, those deals. And it was through those interviews that I, I would say, I gleaned my the most significant learning I was able about the way that about the way that that world works. Um, um, and and actually, just just to make a final point there, um, you know, that's that that going that type of research is a, is actually quite a different way of doing research than most say economists will do. Most economists don't methodologically they are not going around interviewing people they are building models or analyzing huge data sets um and thinking about the world in, in a different way rather than going going out there into the world and talking to the people that are actually working at the at the coal face of these of these businesses um so that's that's predominantly how i went, went about doing it i don't know if that answers any any of your question or all of your question but that's the best i can do Emily, it's really interesting. Colin, you've been very patient. Fire away. You'll have to get yourself off mute, though. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And and sorry, I'm I'm on my phone because I'm out and about, and I may not be able to stay much longer. But I really wanted to say thank you to Brett because I, I read your book, and it's one of the best books I've ever read. I have to say, especially on energy issues, it's um it just confirms so much of my experience as a trade unionist to a trade union just transition uh, organiser in Australia where it, what you describe is exactly the situation that is playing out in Australia uh, over and over again. And when I raise these sorts of issues about zero marginal cost of, of renewables, the plunging uh, wholesale price, all of these the issues you raise, none of the developers that I deal with, and I deal with large-scale uh, offshore wind developers and others, none of them can counter it. it they agree when they're being honest. Um, so it, it's it's such a timely book and, and very important. One question I did have, I, I, do, I would also say that I do a bit of work in Indonesia, and one of the things that troubles me the most about the Just Energy Transition Partnership that's being imposed on a number of countries in the developing world is they are essentially proposing to impose the sort of marketized energy systems that exist in places like Australia on, on countries like Indonesia. They want to uh, disaggregate their um, publicly owned energy um, 
companies, it, it will all be catastrophically. So the righteous. question, Colin. <laughs> the question is, do you think for solar farms in particular that the they can use integrated storage to ameliorate some of the problems around um, the zero marginal cost issue? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's a it's a question that um, I didn't, as you know, from having read the book. And thanks so much for your for your for your kind words. Um, it's a question, as you know, that I didn't I didn't specifically address in the book. I mean, p- partly, and in fact, lar- in large part, it was because the kind of the the really significant investment in storage that's been coming up has has really occurred in the last twelve has been occurring in the last twelve months or so kind of before I certainly before I've researched the book and even before I wrote most of it. And I think it's I think it's it's probably the most significant absence from the book. And, and you'll not be surprised to hear that it's a question that's been coming up quite often in in one shape or form in the talks that I've done about it. Um and I'm not sure I have a great answer to it. What I would say is this, which is that I think there is a there is a, a hope out there that it will do what you su- suggested, that it that it will ameliorate some of these investability problems. Um, um, and, it, and, and it's a hope, pat- particularly amongst uh, renewable energy developers, but amongst the financial institutions that stand behind them and amongst poli- politicians as well. And, and I certainly see online lots of kind of, you know, lots of kind of very ebullient arguments about oh look how this this is kind of uh, storage has been smoothing volatility in the californian market for example my my current position is that it's too early to tell like i i I really think it is much too early to tell i think it i think it could do however um people that there are people out there who know a lot more about this than me who not least people working in the industry itself who have said to me it may but it may not so um and 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 i think that the the may not argument seems to have two important components to it so one is that yes there are reasons to believe that integrated storage will reduce volatility however at the same time there are a whole array of counter countervailing tendencies that that one can expect to increase volatility all the while and so you know things like the retirement of coal plants for example um and so the the, how the combination of those different factors will play out in terms of volatility is very hard to tell and then the second thing and in a way more interesting thing that has been pointed out is that the the storage business model itself depends upon volatility like it's that it's actually kind of an arbitrage based model that depends upon volatility and therefore and therefore to the degree that integrated storage begins to smooth out that, that volatility it kind of eats away at its own conditions for further investment poss- possibility whether that's true or not i don't i just don't know but that more than one person has made that argument to me so so yes i think there are reasons to to think it might do but i think it's mu- we won't know for quite a long time what type of effect it is actually having on investability. Done, far away. Thanks, Heather. And thanks, Brett. Really appreciate the discussion and hearing your thoughts. Um, I'll cut straight to the chase. Um, I was just, I had a clarifying question. So you mentioned at the outset that you feel like the transition is proceeding too slowly. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to um whom the transition is proceeding too slowly for. So I think there's some pretty significant differences across and within countries and yeah. for what purpose the transition is proceeding too slowly. So are we looking at a 1.5 degree transition? Are we looking at a transition that meets a 2% or two degree emissions target and so on yeah. and, and so forth? Yeah. Um, those are really good. Those are really good questions. And it's, and it's definitely fair to say that in the, in the book and when i talk about it like i did today i kind of i t- i take for i definitely take for granted um um as almost axiomatic 
the the fact that we do need um um more rapid decarbonization of electricity generation i even take as axiomatic the the view that um that um we can and, ex and will expect to see you know m massive growth in electricity and energy consumption more broadly around the world and a lot of people would question that would certainly question um 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 who and what that growth is for and, and you know if you're someone who 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 is engaged for example in the degrowth in, in debates around degrowth and so on i think that there are very reasonable grounds for questioning some of those assumptions um so I, you know so i think i i come at i come at that question with a kind of a very kind of broad generic perspective that it's going too slowly S simply for the reason that electricity generation from fossil fuels is is still going up and of course the reason it's still going up is that energy demand globally is still increasing and i and i and i totally appreciate that um different constituencies as you say even within particular countries are affected or not affected by all of this in completely different ways in terms of um but i don't have any particular answers about about um more nuanced or granular views to offer now on that particular question around differential impacts in terms of in terms of in terms of what this means in, in terms of you know degrees of warming it strikes me as i mean maybe i'm naive about this but it strikes me as naive to imagine that right now that we have any hope of hitting three degrees still less two degrees and i and i and i and actually you know when i interesting when i talk to people working for example at some of those banks that are financing um energy projects both on the clean side and on the dirty side some of them will will say privately they i'm sure they wouldn't say it publicly but they will say privately that their internal planning, their internal modeling that they are currently doing is premised on a world of three to four degrees. That's what they are assuming in their kind of base case expectations right now. And I don't know if you saw it, but um, um, the, the Guardian, in The Guardian recently, they did that. They sent out a survey to IPCC, to, to IPC scientists and uh, like 800 IPC and, and like 400 replied and something like seventy percent of them, I think, in the responses said that their expectations was above two point was above two point five degrees, and so um, that seems completely reasonable to me. Um, and and actually, to be honest, it, it it's not even you know in in a sense I hate to say it, but in a sense, what I write about in this book in terms of renewables development is almost a sideshow to the real story, which is which is the story of the stranding or non-stranding of fossil fuel assets, right? I mean, you can build as much, you can build as much solar and wind power as you want, but if governments aren't shutting down uh, existing uh, fossil fuel production and, and, and if they aren't stopping issuing licenses for new exploration and development, then it's all, it's all a waste of time. And that's the reality that, that we have now, which is that governments around the world are still issuing those licenses uh, willy nilly. So um, we've got a couple of questions here about the cannibalisation idea, you know, the idea that, that renewables are, are eating themselves alive and still leaving the fossil fuels to, to grab the profits in the market. Um, yeah. You know, Peter Kilby's asked about whether um, that's worse because our rooftop solar here in Australia isn't even exposed to the negative prices, so we just keep churning the stuff out. Um, and, and Nick's asked about whether, you know, does this sort of uh, over-competitiveness resolve itself? Is it temporary? Does it resolve itself just through consolidations and yeah. and, and stuff like that? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, those are great questions. I think this is a really real factor. I mean, here in Europe, concerns about cannibalisation sort of disappeared for a couple of years when electricity prices were going through the roof with the and, you know, everyone kind of scoffed at the idea but it didn't take long for negative prices to come back. 
I mean, here in Sweden, electricity has basically been free for the last two or three months, um, just because it's been very. And the idea that 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 you're going to attract significant renewables investment when bankers see those electricity prices is is risable. It's just it's just it's not going to happen. And I and and I think a lot of it does come down to competition. Um, the fact that the the, elect, the electricity generation is a very very competitive sector, renewable energy generation in particular, with very low barriers to entry. But I think even more than that, even more fundamentally to that, and this kind of explains why it's so competitive, is that is that governments are kind of find themselves bet between a I don't know what the right what the right metaphor is, but kind of between on a rock and a hard place. So they they have promised and and said to 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 the electorate and to consumers look we we want to and we are going to decarbonize our electricity generation but we are going to do it at the same time as keeping electricity prices low to the consumer or even reducing those prices and and it's very and it's very hard to incentivize investment in a product whatever that product might be while you are telling consumers that that product will be available very, very, very cheaply, because providing something very, very, very cheaply typically has a depressive impact on the margins that the producer of that product can expect to generate. And I think that ultimately is kind of the bind in which governments find themselves, which is precisely why in their deliberations about how to design electricity markets and how to design the support mechanisms for incentivizing renewable investment they kind of build com competition into that they 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 build that competition and not least in terms of kind of the reverse auctions that are that are used around europe to um to hand out to hand out feed-in tariffs you know producers compete against one another to bid the price down at which and so basically you bid down until prof until expected profitability hits the lowest viable amount at which investment can, can be raised um so as so the answer to the long-winded answer to that question of is this a temporary stage i don't think it is a temporary stage for as long as that comp, comp for as long as that comp competitiveness is built into market and subsidy design for as long as that is the case it seems to me you can get however much industry consolidation you want and you're still going to get you're still going to have relatively low barriers to entry and you're still going to have um uh kind of coercive competition forcing down that that profitability and that pricing so i i think it's here to stay because of the political imperatives that underlie all of this right um i'm going to hand the last question to nick now um brett has to go on the on the buzzer so um uh, Nick's also going to do a vote of thanks and uh, Brett is going to finish up his last spiel with uh, any books that you'd recommend for us. But um, if Brett runs away, I'll invite everyone else to hang on for a moment and we'll talk about what next book uh, we might uh, do as a book club. So over to you, Nick, to wind up uh, and give Brett one last chunky question. Sure. Thanks, Heather. And thanks very much, Brett. Just I, I wanted to sort of confirm you were saying about, you know, government subsidy and stabilisation is one possible avenue, governments doing it themselves, another avenue, potentially market design. I sort of read the book as saying, you know, hoping for the perfect market or the market that really solves this problem is kind of utopian. And I think, you know, you pointed to The Economist saying, you know, oh, we need to reform and then sort of walking that back. I just wanted to confirm that is that the sort of right reading that there's all this weird stuff going on in markets. Electricity is just a really weird commodity and we're trying yeah. to create abundance. And yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I'm definitely of the view that the kind of the, 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 the perfect market out there, not least for electricity, simply, simply doesn't, doesn't exist. And I think you only have to look at, you know, people have been trying to, come up with better market designs for electricity in the context of the growth of renewables and the need for, for decarbonisation for many, many years now. And the fact that they that no one has come up with a proposed design that doesn't have obvious 
flaws and drawbacks as well as potential advantages is 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 pretty is pretty telling um and i do think there's something as you as you'll know from reading the book i do think there's something pretty fundamental about the fact that you know electricity is a very awkward thing to commoditize and 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 that you know electricity markets are nothing if not kind of regulatory constructs um and very problematic regulatory construct i think that that has a, a lot to do with it so i think that is a definitely a very fair reading of what i write yes um just, just